You are listening to Making It in the Toy Industry, episode number 125. Welcome to Making It in the Toy Industry, a podcast for inventors and entrepreneurs like you. And now your host, Ajel Wade. Hey there, toy people, Ajel Wade here, and welcome back to another episode of the Toy Coach Podcast, Making It in the Toy Industry. This is a weekly podcast brought to you by thetoycoach.com. Jeremy Pedower was a kid from Tennessee with zero connections, and today is a toy industry executive, entrepreneur, collector, animated television creator, and a widely recognized face in the business of play. He's also got an entire following on social media in which he has this platform where he communicates with collectors about the value and benefits of investing in collectibles. So Jeremy loves engaging with consumers. I'm so excited to have you here, Jeremy. Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you. And like I said, prior to the interview, you have this unbelievable energy that is so great for the toy space because we need it. Okay. Listen, we this is supposed to be the Willy Wonka big universe. It's supposed to be a little quirky, a little amazing, mm -hmm. magical, and you've got all of those qualities. So I'm truly excited to speak to you today. You're you you are a a true future leader in our in our space. Thank you. I'm excited to speak to you and learn from you. I, I wanna I wanna give a shout out though to like your whole your little bit of your toy journey, how you sold your company Wicked to Cool Toys, and now you're working at Jazzwares as the chief brand officer. You're part partner and chief brand officer, correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I still I still. Yes, I still own some equity in the in the love organization. That. Yes, <laughs> I love. It. I mean, I love it. It's just like a dream. I mean, it's, I think it's what I had envisioned for my future when I was coming up in the toy industry. It's like, I just think it's a dream. That's, for somebody. that's the first step. I mean, yeah. that is the first step, you know, and yeah. you're, you, you're showing so many signs of being brave. I mean, you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's the thing about entrepreneurship in general. Yeah. Like, um, you know, there is a safe bet. There is the executive bet there. You can go down that path. You can have a great career. You can earn a wonderful living and maybe you can get to a CEO level where, you know, you have all of those wonderful perks and serious financial windfalls. But, you know, it's always a good thing to invest and bet on yourself. Yeah. That's 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 the strongest methodology to create wealth. It's the strongest methodology to create connections and gain knowledge that will allow you to maybe achieve the dreams that you start out with because a lot of people discard those dreams along the way and that's okay too by the way there's no right or wrong yeah you know because dreams can change with yeah. where you're at in life but if you stay consistent to that original dream at some point in time it takes a lot of investment and risk in yourself it is a journey I have, and I'm, I'm sure you did it at times too, in your entrepreneurial journey, just moments where I was like, why am I doing this? Shouldn't I just get Definitely. a job and settle down and just do the regular thing all in order instead of this crazy invention of a life that I'm kind of building. And you know, there's no, there's no blueprint. There's no, there's no blueprint. And if you didn't ask yourself that question, you'd be a sociopath. Okay. And then you have bigger, and then you have bigger problems. Okay. Uh, and by the way, that, that, you know, I've said this before, I'll say it again. There okay. are a lot of very successful sociopaths because they don't takes. necessarily, that's, it's not what it takes, but it is an element of discarding other people's feelings and thoughts that really benefit certain people in terms of the way they go. Now, I'm a very emotive person. Mm -hmm. I'm very intuitive when it mm -hmm. comes to emotional connectedness and EQ. Yeah. So th this is a harder path for someone who feels things. And, and you know, especially when you feel risk, because risk is a very real thing. But no, I mean, look, we need more people with a big heart mm. who try to take on opportunities because you end up responsible for so many other individuals who may not have the same ambition in terms of owning or driving or creating something from scratch. Yeah. You know, that's, by the way, ambitions change too. Yeah. A lot of people, after they have one big hit entrepreneurially, are perfectly happy being an executive again. And, you know, even for me, like, yeah. I, like I, I'm on some advisory boards, et cetera, et cetera, but I really like where I'm at right now. And I a like lot where of you're at too. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Welcome to it. You can do it. I believe in you. I know Thank that you can. You. I know you can do oh, it. Oh, I love how this has turned into a coaching session for me. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. that. Life is life is a coaching session. So, okay, I, I do want to ask about some of the, the things in your toy story. Well, it honestly, it's like your entrepreneurial story that kind of led you into the toy industry. I remember when people were still buying dot coms and like flipping them and turning them. And I remember thinking, oh, maybe I should buy some. And they're like $8, $6. Yeah. And you, this story of what you did with like Z.com. Oh, gosh. Would, yeah. would you care to share it again? I had some big wins early on in my career when it came to domain names. And yeah. and it came in the fashion of, I paid for college. So I, I was in a situation where I, I had student loans and didn't have a lot of access to capital. But I did see a show one time where a lady was talking about the fact that she was creating websites and then benefiting from people visiting those sites on banner ads. And I thought, well, how hard would it be to create websites. And I, I had a theory. I had, my first theory was that Yahoo, which was essentially an alphabetical search engine that went from A to Z, as long as it looked like you had a reasonable website, would list things. If I put two A's or three A's, I'd be first in the phone book. Uh -huh. And that turned out to be the case. So I did a lot of toy-oriented and collectible-oriented things on Yahoo and got placed. And then my second theory was, okay, I've got a little bit of revenue coming in. I'm going to invest in other things thoughts. And one thought I had was that domain names had direct navigation traffic. This was in 1997. Mm -hmm. So my thought was, gosh, if you have a generic domain name, people are typing that name in to yeah. see mm -hmm. if something's there. And there's value to that because anytime you have eyeballs that are coming towards something, you can monetize that. Mm -hmm. So to make a long story short, I had some big successes in buying things like act.com, had a lot of traffic and was very valuable and sold it to Symantec for many, many times what I paid for it, uninsured.com and other things like that. But I also had some interesting swings and misses. And one was x.com. <laughs> and so, you know, x is an interesting word because x marks the spot or various things like that. And I thought, gosh, there could be something transactional here. Right. And Network Solutions only ever dropped three one-letter domain names in .com, x, z, and q. And so I reached out to the person that owned X.com, a guy named Eric, and I said, how much would you sell this domain name to me for? And he said, $10,000. He said, but I, I can only give you 24 hours. There's other interest. And I said, okay. I was like, give me 24 hours. And I was scrambling because I, I had loans. I didn't really have yeah. money. I had a little bit of cash flow. And I couldn't convince anybody to let me borrow 10 grand and pay them back soon. <laughs> So I reached out to him again the next day and I said, hey, look, Eric, I need one more day. And I was going to figure it out. I was going to yeah. take my, if I had to, I'd take my student loans. Not a good plan, but you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I reached out and he said, I'm sorry, Jeremy, I, I'm going to sell it to someone else. And I yeah. said, okay, I said, tell me who it is, because what I'd like to do is then offer them maybe $12,000 instead of the 10 and maybe they'll flip it for 20% gain in one day. Mm -hmm. He said, okay. He said, the guy's name is Elon Musk. Crazy. He said, here's his email address. <laughs> so I, uh, I reached out to this unknown, Elon Musk, that no one knew. Oh my and God. I said, hi, Elon. I said, I'd like to you know, potentially offer you 20% gain on your name in one day. And he wrote back and he said, uh, one word answer, no. Oh. And that was it. Never heard another word. But X.com became PayPal. Oh. And PayPal now has a turnover of like $40 billion or something like that. But anyways, the point of the matter is I that I feel a, a little bit of entrepreneurialism is like being Forrest Gump because you're, even if you're not winning necessarily, you're there, okay. you're in the mix. You're like in the, you're in the arena with some huge, remarkable talent. Like I fully believe that I'll look at this conversation 20 years from now and I'll say, listen, there was another giant that I was around. There she was, oh right my gosh, there. Stop. You know it, it, I believe it. I believe it. I believe okay. it. <laughs> well, I so like I so I love the story for a couple of reasons. One, I really paid attention to the fact that you messaged somebody and said the way that you phrased you wanting to buy their product was how would you like to turn a 20% profit in one day? I just yeah. thought oh, that's so smart. Can you but, imagine saying that to Elon Musk? I know. That's hilarious. That, I don't know. Just... <laughs> but, but by the way, but by the, that is the way to so position smart. Someone. Because because offering someone $12,000 when they just paid $10,000 right. may not trigger 
the type of thing that saying you could earn 20% in a day yes. could trigger. But yeah. Elon Musk being someone who <laughs> on a bad day, a complete freaking genius <laughs> and on a good day is like one of the world's greatest thinkers. Oh my God. Probably wasn't going to be um, persuaded by my tactics. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. How did you not get dejected when you had that moment where he said no? Because like you said, like it's like being in the space with the other people. And I find, and entrepreneurs I know in the toy industry find when they go to that pitch meeting, they get a, a maybe or they get a no and they just feel like I don't belong here. I should just stop. How do you keep showing up yeah. even though you're you're keep getting shut down well i mean i think it has a lot to do with resilience mm -hmm. and i think some people are naturally more resilient than others and that's mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. because you can teach yourself how to be more resilient how? you just have to be you just have to be okay with recognizing that you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea no matter who you are no matter how good looking you are no matter how much money you have no matter how charming you are you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea that's okay. okay. And so if you're okay with not being everybody's cup of tea, then that allows you to continue to take swings until you find the right opportunity or the right people where you are their flavor. And that's mm -hmm. okay. Because mm -hmm. guess what? I can tell you right now that some of the most amazing people I've ever met don't mix well together. It's fine, you know, and, and deals are the same way. Some, some deals were never meant to be and you can't take it super personally. Now, I will say one thing. I hate the concept where people say, it's business, it's not personal. I hate that. It's it's one of my least favorite phrases because people say that when they're looking to do harm. Why okay. Because what I've noticed is because when you when you've when you have been entrepreneurial for quite some time, you tend to find that it the world of business and the world of law have moments where they clash. Mm -hmm. And the only time someone has said to me, listen, it's not it's not personal, it's just business, is when they're looking to take something or they're looking to play a real serious offensive game with you. Mm -hmm. It's if someone says that to you, I'm just saying be very aware. Mm -hmm. What I like to what I I I'll rephrase it yeah. and just say that when you're in a when you're everything everything in business is personal to some extent because yeah. you know you can't separate who you are from what you do. And, you know, if, especially if you're passionate, especially if you love what you do, it's hard to separate that. So, you know, people that I work with are also colleagues, but they're also friends. People that are vendors are colleagues, but they're also friends because I can't live 65% of my life impersonally. Mm -hmm. It's not, so it's, yeah, it's business and it's personal. But the, the bigger point is that it's also okay if a friend a colleague, a business deal, a relative decides that they want something else. All of these things are okay. Yeah. These and it, and as long as you can go into it recognizing that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's you're the part of the equation that needs to be fixed. It allows you I think often to really that that is the part that allows you to be resilient. That's mm -hmm. the part that allows you to, now introspection is important because sometimes like I was on the, I was on an elevator with a group of people once. And one of the people said, my God, you guys are all crazy. And I said, <laughs> I said to the person, I said, like, you know, it's a bad sign when only one person in the elevator thinks everyone else is crazy. <laughs> right. So perspective also comes in play as well. But if you see over and over and over and yeah. over again, a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then maybe a little introspection is, is critical. To okay. par and so pr introspection and resilience can go hand in hand in that regard. I, I, I would love to just, just backtrack a little bit because I wanted you to tell your toy story. How did you get into the toy industry? What was that first job? Share that with us, please. My first job in toys was when I was in high school. Oh. And I worked at Only Kids. It was a small clothing store and toy store in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh. And I went to work there when I was 15 years old. And uh, I worked there from... 1988. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So 15 years old. I was always a collector my whole life, you know, yeah. even from a little, the earliest ages of my life. When and, you collect, um, when you were little. Oh, sports memorabilia, coins, stamps, autographs, just really deep, deep into collecting stuff that potentially had secondary market value. Wow. Always. That, you know, some, some people are wired 
Yeah. So worked in high school in that regard. And then I went to, I did um, undergrad and then I did a JD MBA and I felt like I could stay in school a long time because I was paying for it. And because I was doing the domain name stuff and the web stuff, it was allowing me to, um, it was allowing me to, to try things yeah. and I was able to be an entrepreneur. So I went to Mattel out of uh, business school after I finished at Vanderbilt and I was there for with my MBA there. And I was there for about three years and went to a company called Jack Specific, which was kind of early uh, days. And we really grew that business significantly. And then I, about 10 years ago, we went down the path of starting something new and focused on things like gaming and social media where other people weren't playing. Really had to focus on trend because, you know, it's hard to compete as a brand new toy company against people who are trying to get Disney, Universal, Warner Brothers, Nickelodeon. But being the kings and queens of the independent scene and Mm -hmm. focusing on a whole new way to play like gaming really separated us. So after doing that for quite some time, in 2019, we sold a private equity and like I said, retained a little equity ourselves Mm -hmm. after the sale. And that was to Allegheny Capital. And now under the Jazzwares banner, we're the number four toy company behind Hasbro, Mattel, uh, Lego for the last few months on NPD. Now, obviously these things are yeah. Subject to change, mm-hmm. but we have brands like Pokemon, Roblox, Fortnite, Halo, AEW, Cabbage Patch Kids, and Coco Melon, Blippy, and we own something called Squishmallows. And that was uh, that was one that that we acquired post the the Wicked Cool Toys acquisition. So I, yeah, I'd like to talk about Squishmallows too, but I do have to roll it back real quick. I, when you got into the toy industry. I know there is a story there about how you initially weren't accepted into that first job yes. at Mattel. And you right. fought, and you just pretended like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that I didn't get that message. Well, that's right. And this is part of resilience. You I know, know one, love sub, it. one subcategory of resilience is compartmentalization. Okay. okay. Meaning that something bad happens and you can kind of persuade yourself that the thing that's bad that happened isn't necessarily the end. Now, at some point you have to accept it, but here's what happened. So I went to an interview when I was at Vanderbilt for Mattel, and they sent me a note a couple weeks later saying, I'm sorry, but you were not selected to continue along this process. Mm-hmm. Uh, for whatever reason, I, you know, I, I may have not had my best day. I don't know. Or, or alternatively, there were some really strong candidates that outshined me, and that's fine. They right. did a great job. Now, what happened was I got the letter and I ripped it up and threw it away. And in my mind, ripping it up and throwing it away was equal to it not existing at all. Mm -hmm. And I called Mattel and this person named Ramey Quick, who I'm always going to be appreciative of. They put me in touch with Ramey and I said, hi, Ramey. I was like, I haven't heard back yet. I lied. (laughs) And Ramey said, oh, okay. Because of course, Ramey knows they're all buttoned up and they, of course, Uh, had written back. I I did. I don't do a lot of lying. I really don't. Oh my God. I love it. But in a matter, in a matter where I, maybe I really believed it for a minute, but I, in my mind, I, they made a mistake. Clearly they made yeah. a mistake and, and maybe it was passion that she heard. And, I, and again, very appreciative that she picked up the phone, yeah. but she said, Hey, you know what? She's like, there's a Harry Potter job. And they were just about to launch it. You know, why don't you come in and have that conversation? So I did I met with this lady named Tia, who is awesome, but I didn't get that one. And they said, why don't you come back for this Hot Wheels opportunity? And and that's that's where I got in. And okay. that was 22 years ago. So you did brand management for Hot Wheels that time, right? I did. I did. Hot Wheels. And then, you know, I was, I was okay on that business, but I was really, really strong on the entertainment business. So, you know, Mattel at the time was getting the Warner license, Batman, stuff like that. And SpongeBob and He-Man was being relaunched. And so I had a really great opportunity to focus on those brands. I want that to be just inspiration. There are a lot of people who want to break into the toy industry. And I'm not saying like, you know, pester them until they give you a job. But just keep in mind that, you know, a company as big as, let's say, Mattel has so many different departments. Just because you're not right, the right fit for one department doesn't mean there might not be opportunities lying for you in another. I, I have That's a... Right a slightly similar story where when I was applying for a job after TRU closed, you know, I was enjoying my time off for a bit. Then I was freaking out and I was like, I need a job. I need a job. (laughs) I applied to a hundred jobs. Seriously. I like wrote a list and I checked them all off. And this one company, I'd been seeing their job posting come up 
And their job listing was for such a junior position, but the way they were describing the job, it sounded senior. So the salary was way too low for me. The job was way too low. I go in and I'm like, yeah, hi, I see your job description, but that's not what you need. You actually need me. And I'm going to be like twice as expensive as that job description. Let's have a conversation. And it worked. So I always... Yeah, I I think people should just go for it. If you really believe that you have the skills, right, to fit what they need, go for it. Yeah, Yeah. and then the other other thing is once you get the job, do it a little differently. Why do you say that? Well, because it's – especially when you're early in your career, it's Uh easy to be part of the pack. And being part of the pack is fine. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. But if there's something special that you can bring to the table – it gets noticed and it gets noticed pretty quickly. So what I brought to the table was, remember, I had a whole history of dealing with collectors and specific categories of business online mm-hmm. with my series of websites. Okay. Your absolute and series? Absolute series. Mm. Two A's. So I could be listed first oh, on every. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, because Yahoo's algorithm was as simple as a phone book. That's hilarious. And so so I brought that to the table and whether whatever it was on, Hot Wheels or He-Man, I had a very specific engagement with the collector community where I put myself in front of it. Yeah. Because collectors don't want to talk to a machine. They want to mm. talk to a person. Yeah. And so people found it interesting. They found it fascinating, people, my colleagues, and they found it entertaining. It was a subject of, of much humor, but never got in trouble for it. It was always very respectful of the fact that, you know, Mattel was paying my salary. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, right now, I think the more normal thing for especially fig- action brands and maybe big fashion doll brands is, is that there's a human being that you know or is attached to the brands that you're communicating with and that you feel... Uh, is guiding the brand in the right direction. And I was definitively one of the very first that was doing that sort of thing. But wasn't it hard to kind of come out and change some the norm? Because I always position myself as like a designer with a business sensibility. So I would like come in yeah. and say like, I'm going to design for you, but I actually will look at it how the buyers want to look at it. But I always came up against a lot of contention. Like, did you ever come up with against contention for what you were doing? No, I lucked out, but I also had some street cred from some of the things that I had done with domain names. Gotcha. So people, True. So people, True. people were kind of like, okay, we're going to let this person do something because we're not exactly sure what he's doing. Right. Okay. Um, and so because, because it was a little bit more difficult to figure me out, right. they gave me leeway. And, mm. just, and again, right. Like they say, you know, you give people enough rope to harm themselves. And essentially that's, that's, that was never that never came to play. No one ever had to, you know, get me in trouble. But but I will tell you when you're in a scenario and you're a creative lead. Yeah. And you are in a scenario where you've also got business sensibilities. Mm-hmm. That's something that gets really appreciated the more leadership role that you take on so with an organization. So true. Yes, that is very true. Yeah. But early on. Early on early, they're like what are you doing? <laughs> like what? Be, it could be off-putting depending on who's in the nurturing or mentor type role. Yes. If you've, got a, if, you've got, if you've got someone who's threatened mm-hmm. easily, mm-hmm. Uh, a young person that has that kind of mentality can be threatening. But you yeah. know what? As your career continues to roll on, I guarantee you that you will find that more and more and more valuable. Oh, my gosh. You're, you're just the best. Okay. I know we're supposed to talk about NFTs and we will get there. So <laughs> how about how about we get there now? So yeah, you you talk a lot about NFTs, you talk a lot about the metaverse, but I yeah. am still learning about the space. I'm getting involved as kind of like a consultant on the toy side with some projects just to learn. So cool. I'd love to hear how you would describe NFTs. I, I've heard you say them they're essentially digital goods, similar to our physical goods, but they have so much more possibility. So please, how would you explain NFTs? Well, I, I will just say this before I even start. I have a strong preference towards physical collectibles. My portfolio of collectibles is like 95% physical. But I think digital collectibles are interesting if they are not abused. And there's a lot of abuse going on in the NFT space right now. And I'll explain what I mean. So first, I will tell you the benefit of a digital item. Okay. okay? So if you accept the concept that you could have a trading card, like a Pokemon card or a sports card that's worth a million dollars. 
And there are plenty of them that are actually worth a million dollars. Kind of amazing, but it's the truth. I mean, there are some trading cards that are worth $30 million. Wow. Uh, mind numbing, mind blowing. <laughs> okay. Like there's a 1952 PSA 10 Pops Mickey Mantle rookie where there's only three in the population report at that grade that's worth 35, 40 million. That's so upsetting. <laughs> PSA, but we do live in a world where you know people want to diversify their portfolios, yeah. and they have. You know, right now we're seeing maybe more than ever the need for diversification as the stock market's down and housing market's going to take a hit with interest rates and all that other stuff. So physical goods are an interesting thing. But all right, let me describe digital for a yeah. moment. So if you accept the fact that you could have a physical trading card that's worth a million dollars in my in my left hand, uh -huh. I can't even find it anymore, but whatever, <laughs> in one hand, then the question is, why can't you have a digital item that's worth a million dollars? Because they're both meant to be collectibles. They're both meant to have scarcity. There's a demand and, and supply. And if the demand is significantly higher than supply and it's a really well-structured system of collectability, the only real difference here is that the physical good that sells for a million dollars, that card may have cost five cents to produce, 10 yeah. cents to produce. Mm -hmm. So the physical atomic structure of that card only gives it a 10 cent advantage over the digital collectible. So the other nine, the other nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and 90 cents mm -hmm. is goodwill. Mm -hmm. And so the question then becomes, well, what can a digital collectible do that a physical collectible can't do? And a digital collectible can be a, can give you access. It can give you, um, a group of other people that you're a part of. It can give you a country club. It can give you a concert with Snoop. It can give you all kinds of stuff that that physical good can't give you because it's sitting on your shelf that there's no indicator other than the fact that you hold it, that you own it. And so yeah. the digital good has a lot of potential utility. Now what's happened in the NFT space though, and the reason why it's a lot of disasters going on right now mm -hmm. is that, the barrier to entry in physical goods is high. You've got to manufacture, ship. You've got to Market. invest in corrugate. Mm -hmm. You've got to you've got to invest in all the hard costs of developing and shipping and selling into a retailer mm -hmm. or selling through to a consumer. It's a different thing, and and also licensing comes into play more often mm -hmm. than a digital item that may be the barriers to entry are so low. Mm. Like anybody can go create a digital JPEG and sell it as an NFT. Right. So if you have people who are only doing it for the immediate benefit, the money right off the bat, that's mm -hmm. it. It's just mm -hmm. a money game. They don't really have a roadmap or a plan to provide utility or access. Then what you essentially have is something that's valueless. And the value is only based on expectation, which will never be met. So the challenge right now on NFTs is that you've got a lot of utility mm -hmm. potential mm -hmm. that is almost always unmet. And you don't have roadmaps, but you've got a lot of hype. Yeah. And investors will only fall for that so many times before they get fed up and say, this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that will also impact the legitimate projects that are that do have a lot of potential utility will give you access will give you the opportunity to essentially be kind of like an owner within a world of of other people that may have similar interests and one of the other things i liked about nfts early on is that cuz i you know for me i try to get involved with stuff really really early and so clubhouse was a was a critical place to talk about it like yeah. a year and a half ago yeah and it was really cool because what you were finding is that the digital collectible space was cutting through all barriers, gender, culture, religion, mm -hmm. race, everything. It was just blasting everything to smithereens yeah. because you were all, you know, you were all crazy cats or bored apes or whatever. Mm -hmm. you, you were wearing a different badge yeah. than the ones that you wear in your physical universe. Yeah. But the problem is, when you have one or two or five or 10, you can kind of follow it when there's a, a million of them. All of a sudden, nothing really connects with you anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's my dissertation on <laughs> NFTs and physical versus digital. So, so yeah. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. 
I tried yes. to sell, I sold things to my family all growing up, had jewelry businesses. I've always been this way. Love it. So when I see the NFT world, I'm just like, okay, so you're telling me you're going to make a product, price it, sell it, and not know exactly what's included in that product and therefore not be able to accurately price it because who knows what part of your event you're going to have in the future that all these people can come to? Who knows what physical good you're going to release when you hit a certain number and then you have to give it back to all the people who helped, who bought the NFTs when they first minted or whatever. So I don't understand. And this is probably where the roadmap comes in. But still, yeah. I'm I'm just, who in the world is able to build such a robust, defined structure of a business and deliver on it either year after year or month after month and price it in a way that it will make up for all the things that they're promising. You can. Uh-huh. And and NFTs will evolve to yeah. where there will be certain programs that actually persist. There'll be some very big ones that are born out of this, big franchises. Like what? Board Ape Yacht Club. You think Board, so? Up, Board Ape Yacht Club, World of Women, CryptoPunks. These types of things over the over the course of time may have ups and downs. Yeah. But will, you know, Board Ape, I think, has, I forgot what it was, $500 million investment to build it out to be a total franchise. Like, like there's some real money being poured into these things to turn into something else. Now, with all of that said, 99.5% mm. of them will go directly to zero mm. and in total flames, burn up mm. the atmosphere. <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying there'll be some huge winners and a lot of a lot of, unfortunately, folks that lose uh, 100% of their investment. Unlike physical collectibles, where you've got a long, long history and a deep-seated collectible community. But I'm not anti-NFTs. I'm mm. just very pragmatic. I'm yeah. very pragmatic. I, I, I hold some. Like I said, mm. if you look at my total diversified portfolio of stuff, right. NFTs and digital collectibles are going to be part of it. The way I think it's going to evolve. Yeah is NFTs are going to be utilized promotionally and for utility. NFTs in the music space haven't even begun to become something that's meaningful, but just wait until, you know, someone, I don't even know, I'm trying to think of something super, super creative, like Kanye. Mm -hmm. Kanye is like a genius of an artist, right? Yeah. Interesting guy, also a genius. He's a genius, genius, genius of an artist. Yeah. yeah. And so if Kanye drops uh, an album and it's he's going to say, you know, I'm going to create 100,000 NFTs and this is the only way you can hear this particular oh. single, then that's an interesting path. And then there's a secondary market for it because just simply owning it mm. is meaningful. So yeah. when you take a digital asset mm -hmm. and you turn it into a digital collectible, mm -hmm. you just have to find the right attachment. You just have yeah. to find the right pairing. And I don't know if art is going to be the number one use for NFTs. It was certainly the first use. It was mm -hmm. the way we like all kind of caught onto it mm -hmm. and it gave the power to the artist. But, you know, I think that there's a lot, there's, there's a lot more, there's a lot more to this space than just this. And it's not something that's going to go away. Also the utility of being able to track and pay a creator royalties on second and third sales. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And really good for music. Yeah. I mean, really good for yeah. music. Think about all the great musicians who have been so screwed over throughout the years because there were not really, you know, the, the world was kind of tilted against them. Now I'm thinking with Jazzwares, didn't you guys just partner with World of Women? Women? Yeah, World of Women. Women, World of Women. What's that all yeah. about? <laughs> so World of Women is an NFT program yeah. that is a female created world of 10,000 different, very empowered, very diversified very interesting art women. Okay. And so when I looked at it, I thought, well, you know what? If someone came to me with this, and by the way, not for nothing, but it had really great traction. It had Reese Witherspoon creating a movie and TV series around it and all those other things happening. And so I saw it and I thought, you know, if someone came to me with this art, mm. it would be something that would be really interesting from a fashion doll standpoint. Mm -hmm. So even if, God forbid, the worst case scenario happens and I wake up tomorrow and NFTs are all zero, mm -hmm. you have this interesting basis in art that we can create a program around where we can celebrate really empowered, strong women for women's sake. And that's and that's what led me towards it. That's what led this the Jazzwares towards it because we saw it as really having the right theme and the right play pattern, regardless of what the source 
was, whether it was TV or movie or NFT program, whatever, just had a really good, strong play pattern that we could sink our teeth into. So is it going to be dolls? Yeah, it's going to be a great fashion doll line uh-huh. that's based on the art from an NFT program yeah. called World of Women. Yeah. And we will sell certain things directly to the community, mm-hmm. like and offering value and utility to the community. Yeah. And then we will also sell things off that roadmap to consumers who just think it's really cool. There is one quote you said that the metaverse is a multiverse. Love that. The There's... metaverse is, people misthink it. They yeah. think like the metaverse is a place that every program is going to be on mm-hmm. and that it's just one place. In the meantime, in our physical universe, yeah. there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. Are there really? That's a fact. And so when you think about what the metaverse is going to be, uh-huh. it's just going to be a bunch of disconnected ways to engage with other people on a digital platform. Now, over time, the metaverse will become more and more sense driven. So right now you have your sense of sight, your sense of hearing, but you know, think of it like console gaming. Every single time a new console generation is launched, the experience becomes more rich. Mm-hmm. And so after a few of these, maybe I'm, you know, I'm 48, maybe I'll be 80. But at some point in time, I'll be 80, but I'll be plugged into something and I'll be like, wow, this is exactly how I felt when I was 25 years old. Ooh. Maybe it'll be reinvigorating. I don't know. Yeah. But, but the challenge is that we all need to maintain our humanity as we continue to become more and more digitally focused and driven. Because we, because no matter what it is that we face in the digital world, there's a lot of stuff happening in the physical world that we can't lose sight of. The more people that have wealth and access are lost in a world that is fantasy, the more people who don't have those things are harmed in a world that's reality. This this brought me back to a colleague of ours had posted about his kid like getting upset because uh, something that happened to them on on Roblox and okay. he's just like feeling hesitant of the metaverse because he's like my kid's all upset about something that happened in Roblox and okay. I just want her to play outside and not be bullied by random strangers on the internet. I did go into the jazz wears Roblox world <laughs> because I had to do my yeah. research and yeah, I absolutely. loved it. But how do you navigate that? Like, were you nervous to have to now take care of a digital space like as a company? No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I think that it's just the reality of, you know, your life. You, you know, you've got kids today that are teenagers dealing with social media. It is you can't shield people from it. You, I mean, yeah, you can. But then if you shield them, you disarm them yeah. from what's to come. Like, you know, when most dating is done through online services, what happens if you, if you send a babe in the woods, you know, to deal with that and defend yeah. with that and yeah. never, no one ever said anything mean to them on Snapchat. And then all of a sudden they're having to deal with dating yeah. in the world. of digital life. Like, okay. don't do that to a kid. Let, yeah. let them deal with what the reality is. So what I would say is, yeah, Roblox is a fact of life. You know, and on Roblox, if you play a game, there are certain transactional and trading things that can happen. You might get ripped off. Now, if you do get ripped off, then you got to teach the kid what and how not to get ripped off again, not by Roblox, but by another user who's acting badly. And then, you know, there are certain children, of course, just like there's certain adults Mm -hmm. where resilience is low. And it's it's impossible to describe in, in a very brief number of words how to empower those kids. But it requires a lot of time and effort and energy that as a parent, you will know. The big statement here is don't don't strangle your kids with your own morals and values because you don't understand what's going on. Most parents don't understand the medium. They just freak out because they'll see some, oh, it's, oh my God, my kid got ripped off. Well, <laughs> What? So did you when you were trading your trading cards in 1987? Oh, Aaron. true. So, yeah. Like, if 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 your parents told you after that bad interaction where yeah. you traded a Hot Wheels card or car or something yeah. that you could never play Hot Wheels again, who are you going to be mad at? The person yeah. that ripped you off, or your the parent. parent never took five minutes to understand what it is that you're doing in the first place? But I also want to also mention the fact that there are kids that that truly don't have the skill set to defend themselves right. and that do require extra time and energy and effort. And that's not what this conversation is about. Right. This conversation is about kids that fall within a range that 
do have that capacity. And I think most parents understand whether their children do have the capacity in that particular moment. Mm -hmm. And there's really no value judgment, Mm -hmm. you know, about it. It's just a matter of saying, you know, our kids are going to experience things that are different from us. There are certain elements of mores and ethics that transcend whatever the medium is and, you know, partake a little bit so you understand what they're experiencing. I I like dove into the Roblox world because I just wanted to know what all the hubbub was about. And I, I don't know it to me, it looked like the Sims live. I don't know if you know the Sims at all. I was very oh, into the please. Sims. I love the Sims. Really? I'm like, I'm yeah. I was like real yeah. obsessed <laughs> with the Sims. Dude, so, I love it. I, same. That's kind of what it reminded me of. I'm like, oh, so this is, or Habbo. I don't know if you know that, or like some of those like virtual worlds. Okay. It seems like, you know, have, <laughs> yeah, it seems like kind of yes. like that. I know all of it because when you are a toy maker yeah. and you are in a scenario where you've constantly got to recreate yourself and your business, you, you have to know what kids are into. Mm. And so for me, what it always meant is it gives me a great excuse to play. It is. It's a- We're in this business. So go play, go have some fun because, it's research. you know, there's, it's research. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Total research. <laughs> we're working. Okay. Well, since we're talking about Squishmallows, I would like to kind of switch a little bit into the inventor entrepreneur route, if that's okay. Squishmallows was an inventor item, right? Squishmallows was was not an inventor item. Oh, Squishmallows what? I was, heard it was an inventor well, item. No. So Squishmallows oh. is an interesting. So um, a guy named Jonathan Kelly okay. at Kelly Toy, which was an acquisition by us. So we oh. acquired. So our CEO, Judd Zaberski, has a really good eye. And I, I can say that as someone that has a reasonable eye myself. Mm. He has a really good eye. And he identified that this business was doing really well. Mm. And Kelly Toy historically had done things that were more commoditized in basis, like, like you know, what's next year's plush going to be? It's going to be you know, zebras, or it's going to be, you know, whatever, narwhals, you know, and so, but Jonathan was inspired by the idea of creating his own platform. And he came across the concept of the, just the way that the the materials were treated. Mm. And he put it out there in, I think, 2017, and I think launched at Walgreens in a certain number of stores, and it blew out. Wow. And then they started leveraging socials. And then a couple of years later in 2019, late in the year, early 2020, we acquired uh, Kelly Toy and Jonathan stayed along for the ride like myself. And now it's become, you know, one of the biggest brands on NPD. I think it's number two behind Pokemon. It's amazing. And all of them, yeah, crazy. It's like, what, and, what do you and, think and, was the yeah. thing that made it so special? Well, I mean, I think that timing sometimes helps yeah. once you once you've carved out your leadership position it's hard to, it's hard to compete mm. like funko's done an amazing job in in their figural universe yeah and it's it's difficult for me to say hey i've got this new platform thing and we're going to go directly up against funko and i'd like to think that we've achieved the same thing in plush yeah where we've got this irresistible group of characters that people are very emotionally invested in mm-hmm. And that we, you know, really care about the community of collectors that, and and it is, it tends to be an older age consumer, which is really interesting, really interesting. And the other thing is, you know, I I love the collector market and the secondary market and Squishmallows tends to be about the primary market and just about the experience and owning it and hugging it and it being part of your primary collection with no specific objective to sell it. So it's awesome. It has all the indicators of something that'll be around for a very long time. What advice would you give somebody if they were thinking, I've got an idea that's like a Squishmallow. I just want to do it. I just want to launch it. I just want to make it. Is now the time? Is it bad time? Is it? I don't know if there's ever a good or bad time for anything, right? I mean, because in life, if you're young, you may have all the energy and enthusiasm, but not the experience. Mm. When you're old, you may have less energy and enthusiasm, but a ton of experience Mm. and you're more risk averse than ever before. There's no, there's no perfect time, really. I mean, the one thing that my, my wife's uncle told me at one point, he's like, you were born an entrepreneur. You've been working as an executive for a long time. Before you're 40, you should start a company or you should get involved as, a, as an entrepreneur again. And I was 39 
you know? So I, I like in my mind, I, you know, I had those little things sticking in the back of my mind. Like, well, shoot. Like if I'm not 40, if I'm 41, it's too late. There's no, there's no magical time. There's no magical anything. Maybe there's things that act as catalysts that get you to try something because you set a kind of like you set your own, you set the standard, you set the moment, 50, 40, 30, yeah. Yeah. this much experience, VP, director, whatever it may be. <laughs> but, you know, at some point in time, you just have to, an idea and a really reasonable plan. If you don't have a good plan, you probably are not ready. If you have a decent plan to match your idea, you're probably ready. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. All right. I'm going to ask you some closing questions. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yeah. All right. What is the best piece of advice that you got in the first year of your toy career? Oh, goodness. I don't, I don't remember specifically, but I can tell you early in my career, yeah. I received a piece of advice that was very valuable and I'll never let go of it, Okay. which was, it was an Irish guy that said this to me. Because we just took over, we just acquired at a company that I worked for a different category and I didn't have a background in this category. Okay. And I told the person, I was like, I don't, I don't know this category. He goes, don't worry, mate. He goes, it doesn't matter what you know. He goes, all that matters is you know people that know stuff. <laughs> and That's so true. <laughs> and that was really helpful because I was always the type of personality yeah. that felt like I needed to know a lot about what was going on. And then... From that, I was like, okay, I can get a lot more done if I just trust people a little bit more. It's so true. And a lot less stress. Like you can a get more sleep. Stress. Yeah. No, that's so true. Yeah, 100%. So uh, that's one that I'll never forget. Another piece of advice I received later in my career yeah. was I was sitting with a guy named Jack Friedman, who was the CEO of uh, Jack Specific. He had oh, created okay. three publicly traded companies, THQ, LJN, and Jack's. And I said, Jack, I was like, what's it like to be rich? I was like, I was like, I, I'm desperate to know, you know, I moved eight times by the time I was 13 all over the South. Like I said, paid for school and, and had some wins, some real yeah. wins, but yeah. like, like a real rich guy, you know, I wanted yeah. to know like, what's yeah. it like to be Oprah or what's it like to be this guy, right? <laughs> and I said, so I asked, I said, screw it. I'm going to ask this question. And he said, well, he goes, I'll tell you. He said, here's what it's like. He said, every potential good or bad thing that you can do, you do it to a much bigger degree. He said, so if you're bad, you can be a really, really bad guy. Oof. He said, if you're, if you're good, you can be a philanthropist. Everything is magnified. Mm -hmm. And that's what the power and the value that being rich provides for you. And I thought that's pretty cool. You know, because I was pretty sure that I wasn't a bad guy. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was, at least I wouldn't do harm yeah. with success. A lot of people that go down the entrepreneurial route tend to not necessarily have the strongest. Well, I'll just come out and say they tend to be a little sociopathic. <laughs> not, they us. Tend to be, <laughs> not us. Not us. <laughs> not us. We are empaths. Uh -huh. We are empaths. Yeah. We want to compartmentalize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no. And so... So listen, you can do both. You can, you can maintain your sense of integrity, mm. your sense of self, and you can take risks. Yeah. Yeah, you can. People always ask me, how did you do all this stuff? And I'm like, just don't research anything. Just dive in. <laughs> because once <laughs> you start researching, you'll be like, oh my God, that's a horrible idea. Last, yeah. right? Research, research can kill uh -huh. idealism. Mm -hmm. the, if you're an idealistic personality and you yeah. involve yourself in a lot of research, you yeah. can talk yourself out of everything. Anything. Yeah. Last question. What toy blew your mind as a kid? Oh, what toy blew my mind as a kid? Um, th well, the LJN wrestling figures in 1983, they were like these big rubberized action figures of Junkyard Dog and Hulk Hogan and all those guys that I loved. And oh, I uh, blew my mind because it yeah. was the first time I had seen licensed wrestling figures. I didn't have to use my Star Wars figures anymore to wrestle. Oh, <laughs> Fine. Cool. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and yeah. giving just amazing quotes. I appreciate you. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. It was a Thank pleasure you so having much. you here. Oh my gosh, you're the best. Thank you, Jeremy.
Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. My interview with Jeremy Padauer of Jazzwares. Now, before we dive into the summary of today's episode, I've got to give a listener shout out to... Jazzwares. Jazzwares has been attending the TCA virtual pitch event, the Toy Creators Academy virtual pitch event, ever since the very first one. So I just wanted to give a shout out and thank you to the company and to David Winter, who I first connected with to invite them to the TCA virtual pitch event. And now connecting with Jeremy has just been fantastic. I so appreciate your support, Jazzwares. And I know that my students really enjoy the process of pitching and working with you on new inventor ideas. Let's dive in to our quick conclusion. You don't want to miss this. Now, today's conversation was intended to focus on the world of NFTs, but we ended up talking about entrepreneurial journeys and corporate paths working in and around the toy industry, while also addressing what NFTs are, the future of them, digital goods, compared to physical collectible goods. Now, there are a few things I want you to walk away from this episode with, and I want to recap them right now. Now, number one, if you are a newish toy creator or an aspiring toy creator, I want you to know about the company Jazzwares, where Jeremy currently works as the chief brand officer. Jazzwares is one of the world's largest toy and collectible companies, the global master toy maker for Pokemon, Fortnite, Roblox, Micro Machines, UFC, AEW, Halo, Coco Melon, Blippi, Cabbage Patch, and so many more. If you don't know what a master toy maker is, essentially it means this is the company that currently holds the license to produce toy goods for those brands. If you want to learn a little bit more about licensing, we've done a few episodes about it here on the podcast, but I'm sure we'll do more in the future. Check out the toycoach.com forward slash 23, and also check out episode number 39, the toycoach.com forward slash 39. Those are two great episodes about licensing and specifically a big licensing event that happens in the toy industry. If you want to learn even more about how you can license your ideas, what that means, I want to encourage you to check out Toy Creators Academy. You can do that at toycreatorsacademy.com. Okay, let's keep on going. The number two thing I want you to take away from today's episode, well, I've got to restate a quote that Jeremy gave us in this interview where he said, quote, as we continue to become more and more digitally focused and driven in the digital world, there's a lot of stuff happening in the physical world that we can't lose sight of. I love that quote because we're just talking about staying human, even though we are going to be living a little bit more digital in our lives. We can't forget about the physical world, the people in it, how they feel, how we're interacting with each other still matters, even if we're doing it online or in some sort of digital space. The last thing I'm going to recap today, the third thing I want you to take away from this episode, if you are currently facing a struggle in your toy journey, whether it is a lack of direction in where you're going with your idea or your career, maybe it's a lack of funds, you're not making enough money, or if you're having a hard time climbing the ladder in the corporate world, I want you to walk away understanding the importance of resilience in any success story. We talked a lot about resilience today. There's an old saying that goes, it's not about how many times you get knocked down, but it's about how many times you get back up. That is true. Don't let the rejections keep you down for too long. A big part of what it takes to succeed in this industry and in this industry as an entrepreneur in many careers is a never give up attitude. Now to connect with Jeremy, you can follow him on social media at Jeremy Padauer. The link and spelling will be in the show notes. So just head over to the toycoach.com forward slash one, two, five. If you want the direct links to connect with him, to learn more about the company Jazzwares, who does work with inventors, head over to jazzwares.com. As always, Toy People, thank you so much for being with me here today. I know there are a ton of podcasts out there, so it truly means the world to me that you keep tuning into this one. I hope you share this episode with a friend or a loved one. And until next week, I'll see you later, Toy People. Thanks for listening to Making It in the Toy Industry podcast with Ajelle Wade. Head over to thetoycoach.com for more information, tips, and advice. 
Hey, are you an aspiring toy inventor or toy entrepreneur? Then you should check out Toy Creators Academy, the first of its kind online program designed to help you develop and pitch your toy ideas. Head over to toycreatorsacademy.com to learn more.